over to you. Oh. <laughs> Start out right. It's all okay. Good. Welcome, baby. welcome. Thank you. How are you today? I'm good. good. I feel amazing. If I could just share what we had just finished, like I'm just on cloud nine from our photo shoot. Yeah. You made me feel so beautiful. Oh, thank you so, so much yeah. for accepting the invitation yes. to be the July August cover of the Brownstone <laughs> Experience. Yes. And so for those of you who don't know, would you please introduce everyone to yourself? Tell us a little bit about who you are, yes. Miss Moshe Donald. Yes. Um, and who am I? That's a question that I'm like always working to answer because it evolves, right? Like we're always becoming, like Michelle Obama has said. But my name is Moshe Donald. I will be 37 years old in July. Yes. I'm an attorney in Mobile. I'm a mother of a beautiful, amazing son. He's 12 years old. I'm getting married this year. I've been practicing law now for 10 years, but in my former life, I was an elementary school teacher. Mm. Um, I have three siblings. I have my parents. Everybody's blessed and well, and I'm yes. happy to be able to do what I love yes. in the city where I was born. So. Yes, that is such a blessing yes. to be here doing the work, and I see you here doing the work all the time. Uh, again, when I think about the covers each <clears> month, um, I think about a pioneer woman who is making waves um, when I think of certain topics. And so July, we know um, historically before the pandemic, uh, we would think about 4th of July. We're mm -hmm. cooking out. And since the pandemic, we've been so fortunate, um, if that's what we want to call it, to have Juneteenth now as mm -hmm. a federal holiday. Mm -hmm. And so for us, I think a lot of our eyes have opened now to what does 4th of July really mean? Um, so again, I'm just so happy to have you someone who is doing the work um, in the legal arena. Um, but I want to go back because you and I have been in school together since last yes. year was a puppy. Yes. As my mama would say. <laughs> um, way back. Way back. Yeah. Way back. We graduated from the John L. LaFleur High School here in Mobile. Um, and then we went off to Alabama a and mm -hmm. uh, And we met in some business classes, cross paths again. Mm -hmm. After you left a and you went off to Vanderbilt. Mm -hmm. Let's start there. And what um, led you in that direction? It's crazy because I came to A&M to be a teacher. Like I never had it in my mind to be a lawyer because I had never been exposed to that. And I feel that children aspire to what they're exposed to. So I had never met a lawyer, hadn't thought of it. Um, and all the influential women in my life were teachers. Leaders were teachers. And so I had majored in education and um, I never wanted to come home for the summer. I always wanted to stay on the hill during the summer, but that caused me to kind of be done with my program early. And so I got bored and started started to explore in some other classes and I found myself in philosophy and then advanced philosophy and then logic. Um, and one of my professors, Ms. Wilkinson, she was like, you know, you have a mind for law. And I'm like, what is that? Because it's deeper than just like liking to argue with people. I've never really been <laughs> a confrontational person, but I do enjoy a good debate. I love it. I always have. Um, and so that was happening, but simultaneously, I was in Student Government Association. I was um, vice president of the student body. And in 2007, we had learned that the Ku Klux Klan would be in Athens, Alabama, mm. which was not very far from Alabama A&M, maybe like 20, 30 miles. And Don't I was just really outdone that they had the nerve to come so close to this HBCU mm. in the public. Like, it wasn't like a rally in the woods. It was on the courthouse steps. And I got in front of the um, audience at our SGA meeting. And I said, we need to go to this rally. We need to protest and let them know that like, we're not accepting this. You know, this is a different day and age and this is unacceptable and we're gonna have a voice and we're gonna have a presence. And so we did that. We went and we were protesting and I had, I still have pictures. Um, but I had a poster said something about equality, mm -hmm. but it was a yellow poster. I will never forget. And I was chanting, we're all equal. We're, we mm -hmm. were just saying, we were saying that. And there were like a lot more of us than there were of them. And they were like the clan executives cause they had the colored roads. It wasn't just white. It was like red. He might, he might've been a president mm -hmm. blue. It was, you know, it was the serious. Clan, I think they had come from, um, Indiana. Yeah. And so um, I was saying that and one of them approached me. He got just as close to me as you are right now. And he said, we're not equal, like in my face. And um, wow. 
I just remember feeling kind of paralyzed because I'm like, why are you talking to me? Right. Like, you talk over there and we're going to talk over here. Um, and I see a police officer coming to approach us because now the people that are with me are like supporting me and he's coming and I'm starting to feel relaxed because I'm thinking he's going to like resolve this situation because clearly he came to me because we're over here. And so um, he gets over there and he tells me, you better shut your mouth before the I arrest officer. you for inciting a riot. Yeah, the police officer. And I was like, what? And I feel like I intuitively feel like this is wrong. I have a right to say what I'm saying. I have a right to be where I am, but I didn't, I didn't have the tools. I didn't have like the legal mind to be able to say, well, this Supreme court case and what's your badge number and all that. Like, even though I had educational privilege as a student, as a student leader, I cowered in that moment because I was faced with power and I had no resources mm. and I felt really low. I felt voiceless. I felt defeated. And I was like, you know what? I will never feel that way again. I'm going to get the tools. I'm going to get the resources. Like I'm going to be able to get your job. If I like, I'm going to have the confidence to be able to state why I have a, a right to be where I am. And if, if not, you know, I can sue or do whatever needs to happen. Cause I thought about like my brother who was back home, my nephews, like what about them? Yeah. They didn't have educational privilege and some people don't have a voice or their profile. They just don't have like the power to fight the system. Mm -hmm. And so I wanted to be a voice for them too. And then I started studying for the LSAT yeah. and I did well and I had a great GPA and Vanderbilt was the best closest mm -hmm. school because mm -hmm. um, I actually got waitlisted for Harvard, but I got into Cornell. I got into USC. I got into Georgetown. But my family is so important to me. <laughs> I was like, Nashville, like it's Vanderbilt was number 11 at the time. So um, I ended up going there and it was it was great. Yeah. It was a great experience. That is yeah. awesome. So I heard um, that you really don't know what kind of law you want to practice until you get out for some people. Yeah. For mm -hmm. some people. So what did that journey look like for you? Well, yeah. So, so I learned at Vanderbilt because, you know, it's a private school and there are rich kids and kids who are like following daddy's path or whatever. And they already have a job mm -hmm. <laughs> waiting for them. But mine was like, my people need me, my family need me. So what I've really done has been geared towards like what the people need. Like mm -hmm. if somebody calls me for a certain type of case, I figure out if I can do it or not. And I, you know, I try to help them. Um, it's really been led by life circumstances. It's been mm -hmm. led by like the, the problems and the life issues that this demographic in Mobile County, you know, endures, which is criminal, which is divorce, which is child support. Um, and I've also been able to work and have a seat at the table and often at the head of the table uh, for some government entities and agencies as well. And that representation um, is very important. Yeah, you know, so being you a black woman. Open, and, yes. Essentially. Yes. You didn't really claim a specialty. No, no. That's awesome. I kind of go where I'm needed. Yes. And I feel the most satisfaction from that as well. Absolutely. Like I just couldn't be a, a corporate or a transactional law because you know those are the big guys i like to help the little guy yes so, so did i where is the gap when were you an elementary school teacher so i was an elementary school teacher right after graduation okay graduating from law school i actually had my son mm -hmm. my third year of law school and god just always has a plan because mm -hmm. there were people telling me like you need to just you need to just drop out in and your come, third year. yeah in my third year <laughs> and, and and go and raise your son and come back I'm not dropping out like this is Vanderbilt. They're not going to hold my spot and I'm so close to finishing. Mm -hmm. And so um, I had him like right before exams were about to happen. And there's wow. like this this lull in time where like they're done with teaching and you're off to study. And that's when I had him like during that time. And it, it was perfect. And God worked it out that way. I never missed a day. And then I got myself together for um, my, my law school exams. I went and took those. I did well. And then when the next semester started, if I didn't have daycare, I would bring his little boy to school. I would have him in this left hand and I would be typing my notes with my right hand. And, wow. you know, you see on social media, sometimes like professors will get the baby for you and stuff mm -hmm. like they they did that for me, too. My 
professor would hold him or they would grab him if need be. Like they were very supportive. And wow. I finished on time, great GPA. And then um, I love kids. I've always loved kids. Um, I went right directly into Teach for America. Mm -hmm. And then um, I moved back home because all of my support was here for my son. Um, and I just started teaching because that's what my degree was in. Even mm -hmm. though I went to Vanderbilt, I graduated with a degree from A&M in elementary education. Yes. So um, I didn't take the bar immediately. Um, I wanted to focus on him and to focus on teaching because the law can be uh, really stressful, really time consuming. So I taught for three years and I then realized that teachers work harder than lawyers. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so I was like, let me take the bar exam because this is a lot and teachers aren't paid enough, you know. And so... Um, no use in having a law, um, a law degree and not using That's it. That's your so. not going to use. Yeah. So I have a question. Mm -hmm. Did your experience in teaching or in education influence your law experience? Absolutely. And as often as I can, I try to marry the two. So I've represented probably thousands of children by now. Wow. Um, delinquent allegedly delinquent children um what, dependent what is del uh, delinquent is it's like criminal for children but they they can't be adjudicated as criminal because they're children so we okay. give them the term delinquent because children are different oh juvenile legally delinquent i think yes. i have heard that term mm -hmm. okay yeah okay. but it's it's otherwise what would be a criminal act if they were an adult and then dependency is when a child is alleged to have been abused mistreated or neglected and that's like the underbelly of our society. Each of those children in a case like that where they're about to go into foster care, they, they've been abused or their parent is a murderer or something horrible, mm -hmm. um, they have an attorney that's appointed to them to advocate for their best interests. Mm -hmm. And that's a really important role. You have to be certified to do that work. Um, and my perspective from a teacher and also having a child who was autistic, um, has put me in a position to really advocate for children well, especially when the judge, you know, is able to identify that they're not receiving what they're supposed to receive at school. Like I, I insert myself at school, at home, I do home visits, uh, whatever it takes to make sure that a child can have a stable home, as stable as possible. That is yeah. incredible, Moshe. Yes. God has really blessed you to put you in places to bless others through your story. Yes. Um, I think that happens for all of us, <clears throat> but having that perspective, mm -hmm. uh, I think, allows you to move into that purpose uh, with more ease. You mentioned, Corey, having autism. Mm -hmm. um, can you share a little bit about your journey? So um, this is my first child. So I'm like, I don't know what he's supposed to do or not do. I'm, I'm looking online to see when is he supposed to have his first word? When is he supposed, you know, and these things like weren't happening. He was a very beautiful baby. He had really big cheeks. It was like really cute, you know, but then at a certain point, the cheeks didn't go away as he got older. He never lost that muscle tone. Mm -hmm. And because it was like, his cheeks were so big and he wasn't losing that muscle tone. That kind of tuned me in to understand that there were some developmental issues because he was drooling. He would go through like six, six shirts a day. And I'm like, I don't think this is normal. His doctor was like, well, my son is grown and he still drools. And I'm like, well, I don't know your son, but my son <laughs> should not be drooling. And so I took him um, to um, the child neurology clinic in Gulf Breeze. I took him to parent child interaction therapy, ABA therapy, um, speech therapy, physical therapy, occupational therapy, every possible thing to put in place for him so that he could have a chance. He wasn't speaking. He was nonverbal. Now, what um, age was this? So this was, he was about two. Okay. He was nonverbal. Mm -hmm. I had Goodwill Easter Seals coming into my house doing family intervention, teaching me some strategies for him. And we actually had these straws that he would have to drink through to increase his muscle tone. So that's mm -hmm. how he strengthened you know, the control in his face was through these um, straws. And I actually had to go to court, you know, with his dad during this time because when he would be with him, he wouldn't follow my mm -hmm. protocols and my strategies because he didn't believe it. He was like, you know, God's going to help him. I'm like, God's going to help him, but through us, through you, you have to do the work. <laughs> you know, you can't, you can't just rub Powerful. holy oil on him and then just, you know, leave it at that. So um, little by little, with all of these things in place and a very supportive family, got him into Little Tree, which is um, a, a, a preschool for children with autism. Okay, here in Mobile? Here in Mobile, awesome. amazing program. Um, he, he was like 
progressing by leaps and bounds. He was doing so, so well. And then I went to Mertz Elementary School where he, the principal was um, Michelle Adams. Mm -hmm. And she was my fifth grade teacher. And I went to her and I said, Miss Adams, I have all these graphs to show you how he's improved, how his behavior has improved, like no violence against um, property or because he used to kind of lash out. Um, and she said, stop, don't put any labels on him. Don't give me no disclaimers. Just bring him to me and everything's going to be all right because he's very smart and we have structure. That's all he needs. He got there pre-K. He's in the seventh grade now. I've never, not one time had a discipline infraction from him. Not a sad face. You know how they give you a sad face or a red or whatever. I've never had an issue out of him. He's a stellar student. He's very funny. And I know it's not appropriate to say he's off the spectrum because I don't think you ever get off the spectrum, but um, you you would not know. Mm. He's He's going to be just an incredible global citizen he's kind oh, he's cool. funny he's smart he's tall he got a smart mouth yeah <laughs> he'll probably be and a where lawyer might he, get that from? <laughs> <laughs> he loves to debate i mean he's just a really really cool kid and i'm proud of what god allowed me to be able to do for him but also the spirit that god put into him as well to be resilient mm -hmm. and to overcome that is so cards, awesome. Yeah. So the resources um, definitely help to pull you through. Absolutely. Yes, absolutely. Because I, I didn't know. You yeah. know, I didn't know. And um, nothing had really prepared me for that. And now I am um, on the autism board, the regional autism network board for South Alabama, so that we can help other parents who may just be finding their way, don't have resources, um, who are trying to figure it out. Mm. And um through Connect Mobile, I was the chairperson of our project, which was like one of the biggest projects that they've had, which was um, Paint the Town Blue, mm -hmm. where we raised autism awareness in Mobile at Tricentennial Park. And we probably had 1,500 people there. We partnered with South Alabama Psychology Clinic. Their doctoral students would test kids like on the spot. Little Tree was there. If they spotted the yeah. kid that may have had something, they sent them that way. And it just did my heart so good after that to know that because of this event, children who may otherwise have not been diagnosed were diagnosed and were able to get intervention, you know, because Thank after you. five, it's like, not to say it's too late, but um, the rate of intervention is, of, of success is just it's lowered. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. So I'm so glad to hear Corey is doing amazing. Is. I just love the way you cheer for him. Yeah. We follow each other. Yeah. Um, so you got another man in your life. I do. Yes, ma'am. I do. I do. <laughs> <laughs> yes, ma'am. Congratulations. My man, my man, my, my man. man. <laughs> I love it. I love it. So we are almost to your big day. Yes, in November. In November. November 20th. Yes. And I decided to have a destination wedding because I thought I could keep it small. Yes. But the blessing, the blessing of love is that when people love, Incredible. they will come to where you are. Mm. So um, we started out at 50 people. Now we're at 81 people. Yes. Um, and I'm just excited. Like, Kenneth is my best friend. I'm excited to marry him. He gets on my nerves so bad. Yes. But that's how you know. Yeah, you that's know, how that's you my, know. That's my best friend. We went to elementary school together. Mm. Um, yeah, we were actually in the same fourth grade classroom. And wow. uh, we kind of reconnected because he was doing juvenile work as well. He was mm. a juvenile probation officer. Wow. And I would be stuck in court because when you're at that courthouse you kind of get stuck all day mm. and i would run down to his office like can i microwave my lunch yeah can i you know can you give me a legal pad i kind of ran out of paper or whatever the case may be and um he's just a great guy yeah he's a great guy for me he's a great guy for Corey. Mm -hmm. and um you know we're blending our families blending it. our love and the planning has been it's a little stressful because it's there's the language barrier and everything is at a distance but it's also like a cool creative outlet for me because my law practice is so structured. And then here I get to like look at flowers and look yes. at, you know, all these things. So Well, I am so happy for you. Thank um, you. You are wearing all of the hats. Um, and so for you, my question is, what does black girl magic mean for you? Black girl magic means for me that I am able to live authentically like I'm mm -hmm. able to be my authentic self because when 
we're stressed, when we're not sleeping well, when we have so many things on our minds, right? We're not able to operate in our best capacity. We're not mm. able to show up as our truest selves. So I put those things in place so that like the stage is set for me to show up and be amazing. I try to go to bed on time. I try to keep my mind free of like negative energy, negative thoughts, negative music. Um, I just try to set the stage for me to show up as my best. And mm -hmm. when I do that, like I'm killing it. I'm killing it in the courtroom. I'm killing it as a mom because I've taken care of me. Mm -hmm. So black girl magic for me is like putting yourself in the best situation to show up authentically because if you don't have those things in place like you're gonna be sleepy brain's gonna be foggy you're gonna be snapping at people and that is not black girl match yes i love <laughs> and it and then also having like amazing black women around me as well like the real life hack right real life hack <laughs> is not it's not black girl magic if i'm alone so mm. amazing women like you and then have Tommy here and my sisters and my mom and friends. Mm -hmm. Like we all help and support each other and inspire each other as well. Yes, yes, so. yes. I really want to dig a little bit deeper into self-care because that's really what you're describing, mm -hmm. right? Black girl magic is self-care, yeah, right? Yeah. Um, and so I've, uh, we're going to do some cooking. Yes. I'm so excited. Yes, it's a first too. for Brownstone, <laughs> yes, to get into uh, one of your favorite pastimes mm -hmm. and how you're learning to better take care of yourself. Yes. So what is your philosophy on cooking? My philosophy on cooking is like, first of all, get out. That's what I have to tell Kenneth and Corey, like get out of the kitchen because it's my therapy. And so when I you approach. Said, first of all, get out. Yes, That's get <laughs> out. Because <laughs> they like to be around me. Yes. Like I'm cooking. Mm -mm. Now you got an idea to come start doing something. Mm -mm. No, get out. Um, Cause this is my, you know, I set a vibe. I got my wine, my music, and stuff, and I really just get into whatever I'm thinking about, getting into the food because I want to build a flavor profile, and that takes time. And you can't have people in your way because I need the counter, I need my knives, and all that. So I have high blood pressure, and my thinking is to build as much flavor as possible from natural ingredients versus spices. I do use spices. I do use salt, but I would prefer for the onion taste to come from the onion, for the garlic taste to come from the garlic. So I like to put those things together and build like as much flavor as possible on every layer and then put it all together. Mm -hmm. um, I just love cooking. I haven't had, you know, any type of formal education, formal uh, culinary education, but I know what I like and I know what they respond to in my house. Yeah. And so that kind of drives me. I imagine like if I cooked at a restaurant, it may not be good because at home I'm cooking for love. I got time. I can spend as much time as I need. I'm not rushing, but um, I really love cooking. I like to see like what I can create. And it's really um, like a freestyle. Like I'm not good with baking because it's too precise. It's like math. But if I can like add a little bit, take a little bit out, like, oh, I like that. Let me do a little bit more of that. Like that's, that's really my style. That's your thing. Yes. And it brings you peace. It does. Yes. I'm in a whole nother, like, zone. it's, it's, a, it's another zone. It's like how you get lost in painting. Mm -hmm. That's what it feels like to me. Yes. Yeah. And it could also be a love language. Yeah. Is it a love yeah. language? And I asked Corey, like, do you feel, when he, I'm like, what does it taste like? Do you feel love? Yeah. He's like, I feel a hug. No. Like, <laughs> A yes. big hug. Come on, chicken yes. curry. Yes. <laughs> that's yes. what I and that's what I want them to feel. Yes. When I cook. Because it's everything. Like I'm just pouring it out. Yes. Yeah. So. Well, I'm gonna end it there. Okay. Because I definitely wanted to just share you with the rest of uh the Brownstone audience. Yeah. Um, to learn a little bit more about Miss Moshe Donald. Well, thank you. Yeah. And I love Brownstone, too. You know, I've been grabbing your pieces yes. and the things you put me in today, I'm taking them. So. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Yeah. So, ladies, uh, you can meet us next at the table. Well, we'll start talking about some business and legal things. Um, and so join us next. And thank you. Thank you. Okay. Yes. Bye bye. <laughs>